It is now 1am, April 26th, 1986. Unbeknownst to the operators, they are now rocketing down the path to destruction. These next few minutes are critical for the survival or demise of the reactor, and they are equally misunderstood by the general public. So, let's explore them. To recap the situation before 1am on April 26th, we have a deliberate order to lower the power, likely for the testing of vibrations on the turbine, or as a safety precaution during the rundown. A sudden collapse in power, likely due to a fault in the operating system of the reactor. A redistributed xenon gradient inside the reactor, which makes it difficult for the operators to control. An attempt by many people to recover the power, ending at 200 megawatts. Vibration measurements still to be carried out on the turbine. Low levels of water inside the steam separators. With power now at 200 megawatts, the question becomes how many control rods are inside the reactor. This number, as has been repeated multiple times throughout this series, is expressed as the operating reactivity margin, or ORM. If the ORM falls below 15, procedures require that the operators shut down the reactor. As mentioned in the previous video, before the explosion, the only way for operators to observe the reactivity was to input a code into the computer on the desk in front of them and wait at least five minutes for the computer to spit out a roughly calculated value on the panel in front of them. This value would already be several minutes out of date, and a full printout would be needed to justify a reactor shutdown. The display panel could also only output one parameter at a time out of the many that needed to be monitored. Toptonov used this several times throughout the night, and was seen by a few of us, including Tregub, and asked the value by more, such as Dyatlov. In all of these cases, the computer reported a number around 16 to 19. They were in the clear. And also, with power at 200 megawatts, Stolyachuk could now do his job, correct the water levels and turn on all the main circulation pumps connected to the reactor. Main circulation pumps take water from the steam separators and push it into the bottom of the reactor. To do this, you of course need more water in the steam separators, which as you may remember is very low. So, Stolyachuk let loose on the feed water flow. What followed was a two minute period of an increased feed water flow rate by almost 10 times, shortly followed by Stolychuk activating pumps 12 and 22. Now all eight pumps are active, one problem is suddenly brought to the limelight, the reactivity. Feed water temperature at 160 degrees Celsius is little more than half the temperature of the overall coolant, which is 280 degrees Celsius. This means that it reduces boiling, and therefore the number of voids, which are effectively bubbles of steam in the reactor, decreases. The RBMK, as you may know, depends on the positive void coefficient. Deriving most of its neutron moderation from graphite, which slows down neutrons to a speed where they are more likely to collide to cause nuclear fission, the absorption of neutrons by water is more significant in RBMKs than its moderation effect. If you boil the water, fewer neutrons are absorbed and more fission occurs, increasing reactivity. This leads to more boiling, and the cycle repeats. It's not inherently dangerous, and some control rod insertion can counteract its effects, but most reactors derive neutron moderation from water, so the process works backwards in those reactors. Reactivity and temperature increases are self-regulating. The collapse of these voids causes a drop in reactivity in the core, and control rods have to be pulled out to compensate. First, the automatic control rods that help to regulate the power, and then Toptonov had no choice but to withdraw more of the manual control rods. Reactivity remained around 200 megawatts, and still within the limits of safe control rod insertion. In order to keep the power stable, however, 
topped an off unknowingly made what would ultimately be a fatal decision. Seemingly preferentially, he chose to remove control rods that inserted from the bottom of the core, the USP rods. This means that neutron absorption at the bottom of the core is uncontrolled, and it will be much harder to regain control of this in the future. And it is here that we will finally mention the positive scram effect. In 1983, during the startups of Chernobyl Unit 4 and Ignalina Unit 1, it was demonstrated that the insertion of a standard manual control rod from the upper limit, or fully withdrawn, position would result in a brief increase in local power, as water absorption of neutrons is removed when the graphite displacer pushes the water out of the bottom of the channel. Multiple changes to the reactor design were proposed to eliminate this. None of them had been put into effect at Chernobyl. Toptonov is unaware that 164 of the 167 manual control rods in the core are now in positions that could cause a positive scram effect, and with the concentration of xenon slowly increasing, due to the lower power level than before, more were to soon join them. Meanwhile, there is a disagreement between Razim Davletbaev and Anatoly Dyatlov. Davletbaev, the head of the turbine shop, wants to collect more data on Turbine 8 to determine maintenance points, but Dyatlov, just wanting to get the test over and done with, refused to carry it out while the reactor was still running. We will notice this pattern with Dyatlov later. Back inside the core, feed water flow rates fall back to normal levels, water is beginning to boil again, and the automatic control rods respond quickly, inserting themselves. What we are beginning to see here is that automatic control rods, simply meant to regulate the power, are now accounting for most control rod insertion. And to make matters worse for the core, the main circulation pumps are working at or above the permissible flow rates as Stolyachuk struggles to balance them. The water's fast return to the reactor means it has no time to cool, and after a few minutes, water entering the core is already approaching its boiling point. In the control room, the atmosphere is now more relaxed, with the exception of Dyatlov, now rushing people along to do the rundown. People slowly take their positions in the control room, to record data, to initiate the experiment, or to simply observe. But before the rundown begins, there is a problem. Steam separator water levels are still stubbornly low on one side of the reactor. Stolyachuk increases feed water flow rate for a second time, and another influx of cold water is sent to the bottom of the core, collapsing the voids and bringing reactivity down. Again, Toptonov has to remove control rods. Again, automatic control rods withdraw in order to pull up the power back to 200 megawatts, and at this point in time, the Scala computer records the control rod positions. The actual time recorded for this data is now infamous, 1.2230. The operating reactivity margin, in the high teens just 20 minutes earlier, has fallen to 7 or 8. When the feed water surge ends, power almost immediately starts to climb again as voids form within the core. But this is handled by the automatic control rods, doing their job and regulating the power. They insert themselves again, deep into the reactor, bringing it closer to a permissible level of insertion. Outwardly, everything appears to be normal, even as the water temperature at the bottom of the core approaches less than a degree below that of the water at the top. Any slight increases in reactivity will now be greatly magnified by the positive void coefficient. Akimov again goes from desk to desk to check everyone knows what they're doing, while Gennady Metlenko, the electrical engineering supervisor brought in to assist with the test, takes the phone and gets ready to announce the start of the rundown. A final recap before the test begins. We now have a vast majority of control rods at the top of the core fully withdrawn in a position that would allow them to trigger a positive scram effect, a concept the operators are largely unaware of. 
a disproportionate amount of control rod insertion derived from automatic control rods alone. Most control rods that insert from the bottom of the core, where the positive scram effect is most prevalent, removed to maintain the power. A void coefficient of great magnitude, due to high coolant boiling lower than usual in the reactor. High coolant flow rate back into the core, miscommunication between operators, and no operator knowledge of how to avoid what is about to come. At 1.2304, Metlenko issues the order starting the test, oscilloscoping gauge. Turbine revolutions, main circulation pump revolutions, and various voltage parameters are recorded. Simultaneously, Kirschenbaum closed the emergency stop valves for turbine 8, disconnecting the steam supply and causing it to run down. Meanwhile, main circulation pumps 13, 14, 23, and 24 all begin to run down as well, reducing the flow rate from these pumps. And for a few seconds, there is silence. Then, Metlenko looks at Grigory Lysiok, the man who was supposed to press a special button that was added to the control panel in order to simulate a design basis accident. He has one instance of miscommunication. Lysiok had been expecting another command from Metlenko to press the button. After a quick demand from Metlenko, he does, and the signal is sent. Turbine 8 is now connected to Unit 4, powering the main circulation pumps, and the diesel generators begin to start up. The atmosphere was calm as people watched and waited. It would take approximately 35 to 40 seconds for the diesel generators to come online fully. And now the question was how long the turbine would last before it wasn't producing enough power. Inside the core, however, a very different story is unfolding. The reduction in coolant flow rate was causing the formation of voids inside the core, and the positive void coefficient again began to rear its head. Automatic control rods, already bearing the brunt of accounting for the vast majority of control rod insertion, now began to descend even further. But still, power was rising steadily about 1 megawatt per second. Back inside the control room, the miscommunication of the test had struck again. The order to shut down the reactor was missing. Toptonov, seeing the automatic control rods approaching full insertion, did not know what to do, so he turned to Akimov and asked. Akimov, busy watching the results, made a tapping motion with his finger to indicate a shutdown and went back to looking at the results. At 1.2339, Leonid Toptonov presses the AZ5 button. The moment this button is pressed, several events are going to occur in quick succession. The first of these is, of course, the insertion of all control rods into the core. All of them start moving downwards, and this of course means the graphite displacers attach to the rods as well. And for a brief moment, power declines. But then, the graphite displaces all of the water in their control rod channels at the bottom of the core. This removes a significant amount of neutron absorption in that region, replacing it with moderation. Reactivity now increases, which in turn increases the temperature. The water at the bottom of the core, already less than a degree below the boiling point, flashes into steam. Now there is very little absorption at the bottom of the core. Power skyrockets as nuclear fission runs away uncontrollably, building up through the bottom of the core. The B to F value is a measure of determining an increase or decrease in reactivity. A negative B to F is subcritical. Nuclear fission will decline. A B to F of zero is just about critical, with barely enough neutrons being produced to sustain it. And a B to F of one is prompt critical a chain reaction that sustains itself on the prompt neutrons, which multiply faster than any control rod elements could possibly respond. The positive scram effect at Chernobyl alone was about 1.1 beta f, so it caused prompt criticality in the reactor. But the positive void coefficient in the reactor was measured at between 4 and 5 beta f. Combined, 
we now have approximately six times the reactivity threshold of prompt criticality, and nothing can be done to stop it. Steam rushes up through the core, spiking the reactivity in other regions. Temperatures and pressure skyrocket, closing the backflow valves to the pumps and dropping their flow rates to zero. Steam is blasted out of all emergency discharge vents. Two blasts were reported in quick succession inside the core. A final third explosion, much higher in the core, was recorded at 1.2347.7 seconds in the morning, according to seismic data. Pump flow rates rebounded to almost normal levels. This means the pressure inside the core has been released. Chernobyl Unit 4 has exploded, the upper biological shield thrown straight up into the refueling machine directly overhead, knocking it over and crashing back down. The building collapses, crushing Valery Hodomchuk in the north pump hole. Pipes rupture, blasting workers with scalding steam, which even permeates the ventilation system, flooding the building. The ultimate cause of the disaster was the ill-planned design of the RBMK reactor. While positive void coefficients are not inherently dangerous, the coefficient's great magnitude allowed for the runaway which blew up the reactor. Similarly, the design of the control rod itself, ironically intended to improve the safety of the reactor by maximizing the boron component, initiated the runaway. Had the graphite displacers extended to the bottom of the core, then the explosion would have not occurred. Operator error is also at fault, albeit it is difficult to conceive of a way to correct this. Operators were unaware of the ORM falling so low, nor that it had become primarily composed of automatic control rods, which are intended for power regulation, not direct power maintenance. Equally, the operators were completely unaware of the safety significance of the ORM, and not knowing just how important it was, shifted their logic and decisions in an unfortunately dangerous manner. Letting the feed water flow rate and circulation flow rate reach excessive levels placed the reactor in this situation, but it was necessary for safety reasons after the power drop, and some pumps were still above limits during the rundown. The power drop itself is agreed by many to be the ultimate cause of the explosion, making the xenon distribution inside the core difficult to control and leading to the low operating reactivity margin to compensate. As agreed by several of the operators that night, such a drop wasn't unusual. An uncontrollable mechanical failure set them on the path to destruction, and at that point, efforts by the operators to do what they believed was the right thing finished with an explosion.